This is Matt Brown, and you're listening to Just a Good Conversation. My guest today has contributed to not one, but two Pruitt surprises for the coverages of the LA riots and the Northridge earthquake. Not bad for a guy born in Washington, D.C. Todd Bigelow is a wonderful photographer with a passion for his craft. From editorial to nonprofit and corporate clients, Todd's work can be seen everywhere around the world. My headlights catch that the thing had buckled, it, but it buckled up. The bridge overpass buckled up. I hit that thing so hard that I launched my Civic and it comes down. I thought, oh gosh, don't flip. It comes down like on my front bumper. I'm like, you know, diagonally down and I bounce off the other side. My gear comes flying forward. I bust my strobe off of my cannon. It literally snaps off the hot shoe because I had already taken pictures. And I get over to where the fires are burning in Northridge and I pull up right when a long time kind of breaking news spot photographer legend in the valley, Gene Blevins for the LA Daily News is pulling up. And I didn't really know him well and I will forever remember him for this. And I'm like, oh man, dude, I almost, almost, my car almost went off this thing and buckled and I snapped, snapped my flash off the hot shoe and oh man, it's dark. He gave me a flash. He's like, here, take this, Todd. I'm Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. Take a listen to our archives. I've had such guests who are chefs, who have won the Oscar, and college professor Michael Coronado. I came away feeling pretty proud that I was out there for that amount of time producing that kind of content. Um, And when I came back, you know, getting that... Getting that letter from George Rodriguez, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning writer for and covered the Persian first Persian Gulf War, and sending that handwritten letter that said, Mike, you did a hell of a job out there. You know, we're proud of the work you did. And it's like, yeah, you did it. You accomplished this. This is great. This is fantastic. Um, it actually started to open the door because I started to begin thinking about, you know, do I want to go down this path? Do I want to um, do I want to try to be a permanent foreign correspondent? Do I want to try to be a permanent uh, war correspondent? Let's take a quick break for our sponsor before diving into part one of my conversation with Todd Bigelow. Todd, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time of doing this. Matt. Thank you, man. I'm this so is... glad we were able to finally connect. <laughs> yeah, for get sure. Get this done. Yeah. I first reached out to you yeah. like... Fall, COVID was like bonkers. Yeah. Everybody's worried about third wave, yeah. second wave, you know, just waves. <laughs> just waves of everything. <laughs> yeah. I was busier in hell in the fall. Yeah, I was, uh, I, I, I really wanted to jump on this, definitely. Um, busy, you know, in, busy in work or busy, busy in, in school? Work. That's busy good. Busy in work, yeah. It was a very busy year. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Never yeah. slide anybody so, but I'm glad their ass we're, and working. For sure. I just, I'm glad this was, I was looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy we're able to see that. I am uh, so impressed that you're putting out so many, like if you're the start of the tree, the branches come out, you're expanding. You've got books and YouTube and, <laughs> you know, blogs and you're, you're everywhere. You're not like a palm tree. You're like this giant <laughs> oak you're like getting branches. Well, that's, that's nice of you to say. I don't, I don't quite, I mean, I understand the analogy. Um, the branches are, are small, that, you know, it's, okay. <laughs> it's a, it's a small tree maybe with a lot of little branches, <laughs> but, um, and I'm good with that. I've never been, uh, one where I feel like I have to be, you know, the loudest voice or anything. I just, for me, I I'm just growing. I, I constantly am trying to push myself seriously, like just from an internal way. Um, and not just in photography and all of my, you know, in all of my life's endeavors, right. I have other interests like we all do outside of photography and I, and I evolve that, um, in similar ways. So it's, 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 it's been a, it's been good. The last few years, I really do feel like there's been new things that have that have come from me that um, I don't want to say catch me by surprise, but definitely um, I'm glad that I undertook the, you know, process of writing a book and maybe doing some, you know, little YouTube 
uh, you know, tutorial type stuff and, and expanding on my teaching and, and right. shooting in different ways and taking on different little projects. But, um, yeah, it's, it's been good. It's well, tell been, me, where did the seed start? Where did you grow up? Who planted that little seed of Todd? Oh man, my mom. Okay. <laughs> Are you a local guy? You're a Cali um, guy? No, You're... I was born in DC, man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. even in a state. A no, district. I guess not even a state. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even sure I have citizenship. I'm not even sure. No, I was born in DC. Um, funny little story about that is a couple years ago, I was back in uh, Virginia uh, teaching with the Northern Shore course. And um, my uh, my family was living in Fairfax at the time that I was born, but I was born at George Washington Hospital in DC. And my wife sent me an old picture on my phone. This was like only two years ago. And, and um, said, this is your this is where you were born. So you should, you should go back and like find the house. So I called my dad who's still alive. And I said, dad, do you remember the address? And he was just like, so sharp, like, of course. And he like, just rattled it right off. Me and a friend drove to the house. Wow. <laughs> and I knocked on the door, man. And I'm like, nobody answered. So I stood way back, like kind of towards the sidewalk. Cause you know, who's a stranger at the door. Sure. Somebody opened the door. I quickly told them this crazy little thing. I grew up in the house and they were so cool. We talked and it looked exactly the same. So anyway, did it really not it, much of a change? No, which most of the other houses had. It's a, it's a, like most real estate, it's a nice area now. My dad said this was just working class back in 1965. You right, know? of course. Yeah. So, um, did any memories flood back when you, if you walked, did you in? I the, I did not ask to go in. Okay. They didn't offer, um, which would have been probably a little too forward for me, you know. Right. But they were extremely kind, and I talked about, uh, you know, that my father and mother worked in D.C. at the time, and and I was born there, and I showed them the picture on my phone, and they were like, "Wow, it really does look the same," and <laughs> and. Uh, I told, I remember my grandfather holding me there, which is a picture actually that my, my, uh, my wife sent, um, that we have out on our, on a, in our living room. But, um, you know, not, not a lot of memories, but I, I did break my leg. My older brother pushed me in my red wagon and we rolled it. Bro. We oh. rolled the wagon, bro. <laughs> and I broke my leg. <laughs> I remember the that part for whatever wagons. reason. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with the push pedals yeah. and he got me going too fast and somehow it like yeah. flipped over. Slow down, slow down, slow yeah. down. Yeah. Boom. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, and then we lived in Chicago for a few years, but most, most of my life, uh, out here in Los Angeles, uh, 72, we moved out here, um, went to college, Cal State Northridge locally. Uh, was it, was it a small, how was Northridge back then? It was, did it feel teeny? It did not feel that small to me, but, um, it was, you know, I was immediately, I, I went in as an accounting major. Okay. Um, <laughs> which we laugh yeah. at now because yeah. it's like, well, geez, why didn't you stick with it? <laughs> um, but um, quickly found my way into photography and, and photojournalism and became enmeshed with, with the program there. So maybe in that way it felt small because I spent so much time at the campus newspaper right. and with friends like Myung Chun. Right. And, you know, we went to school together. And, Was and photography around in your house? Did no, dad take not pictures in or? any way, shape, or form. We were my my mother was in politics. She was she okay. was definitely an activist. My father was a businessman, um, but news was you know you know we grew up in that area where in that era where the news was always on at night, you know, and the, you know, six o'clock news, whoever it was, Dan Rather, Walter right. Cronkite, you know, I grew up in an era where news was always on either talk radio or something. So in that way, I was very interested in what's going on in the world. I was made very aware of the world by my mother. Um, so journalism felt natural. So I, I ended up switching over to a journalism major with a photojournalism emphasis. Um, and Northridge had a, did, a really good program. Did mom and dad question that? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> that's what you say because <laughs> um, you know that's accounting to you know right, a camera. That's right. a whole different world. It was definitely, um, I think, less. Um, I don't want to say necessarily acceptable because my parents didn't, you know, fight against it. But my father was probably not as on board as my mom was. <laughs> my mom was extremely thrilled by the thought of me going in, you know, traipsing around the world and investigating things that were going on because she was very involved in 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 the world. And, and she went off to Brown at 16. My mom went to Ivy League at 16. Wow. So she, yeah, she was very, very intelligent woman and very you know, again, involved. So she was very happy. Um, she passed uh, 11 years ago now. 
things were, you know, things, I had a good career. I've had a good career. It's still going, thankfully. Sure. Um, and she was very proud of that, you know, and she liked to talk about it. So in that way, it was good. But I think my father <laughs> still thinks like, you know, you would have made a lot more money, man. Faster. <laughs> Faster. Longer, right. yeah. <laughs> right. You could be retired by now. Yeah, probably, you know, I mean. Two things are certain in life, death and taxes, right? You've got to have an accountant to do your damn taxes. So. <laughs> and to die. And to die, yeah, yeah. for that matter. Right. You better have an accountant to die, too. Because yeah, nowadays you just can't die. It costs you money. <laughs> or it's just, costing somebody this money. This is so true. So where did you find a camera on campus that kind of intrigued you to be like, I, I, hey, what are you doing there, buddy? You taking pictures? Gosh, What's that's that? really, that's, yeah, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but um, I took Photojournalism 350, which was beginning photojournalism. The professor was Kent Brickeen Kirkton. I don't know. It was in the catalog. I think I just took it. From accounting, though? You just like yeah. switched. Well, you know, the first you couple from, years. Yeah, but you went from A all the way to B. Yeah. Like, that's a long way into the catalog. To... Totally different buildings, too. Yes. <laughs> you know, I feel and like people. I didn't even know where to go. So. Right. Everybody's yeah. all buttoned up accountants. Uh, and now you're like, oh, with these free was, loving, me young, smelling like yeah, fixer. Yeah, man. It was, and it was definitely different. Those, uh, and I can't remember if I took it second or third year, but it was definitely, I wasn't far into my major, so I was taking it as an elective. Okay. And I I remember the professor, and he made us watch Salvador. Did you ever see that yes. movie? Yes. Nick Nolte. Yeah. And I was blown. Oliver Stone. Stone yeah, right? Oliver yeah. Stone. He yeah, wrote the I, script. Right. And I was like, wow, there's war photography, and like, this is going on. I got to check this out fell in love with the movie and I just started, you know, I took the class. I got a C, man. I got a C in the first photojournalism class. So it was not something that, I don't even know where the camera came from, to be honest with you. I think I must have gone out. It was a Rico, a Rico. You don't yeah. know where you picked it up I don't at? even remember. I really Pawn honestly shop, don't camera know. Store. I probably bought it. Yeah, I probably bought it because I worked all the way through college. I was and working at Rouse. you don't even know why that one, whatever mm -hmm. the guy sold you. Yeah, yeah. It, which incidentally, I bought gear from him for many, many years. He was a local guy here that served a lot of the professionals, a lot of the professionals. So um, I think it was the Rico KR30. Okay. SP. I've Somebody never, go out and yeah. look it up, man. If that's yeah. the right one, send me an email. I've never ever seen that thing. <laughs> yeah. It was. It looked professional. Brick. <laughs> it Big was. Old chunk of yeah. Steel. Well, when I when I decided this was what I was gonna do, I went out and bought two Canon F ones. And if you want to talk about the bricks, man. yes. Yeah. I mean, I could bolt my house now with one of those. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I could literally. That's how heavy they were. And you could defend yourself. I with that could thing. easily defend myself. They were big <laughs> and heavy, and they lasted forever. Sure. I beat the heck out of those things. Yeah. And then, wow. you know, so that's how it started. And, and, and I actually will give a shout out to my buddy, Myung, who's still at the LA times. Um, you know, I think we drew inspiration from one another and, and he was, you know, that he got hired at the LA daily news before graduation. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm like, okay, this is, this is going to happen. He was a like, player. He, he was, was a player, yeah, man. He was and good. and he, absolutely. And, and, um, and at the time we had, uh, I think it was, uh, who was it? I forget. Somebody from the Daily News was also a adjunct professor there and helping out at the student newspaper when the Whittier earthquake hit in whatever year that was, 87. 87, I think. Yeah. yeah. Myung and I ran out and started shooting all the way from CSUN where we're like, oh, well, we got to go cover this. That's a drive. Right. So we went out and covered it and we went back and we ended up doing like a multi-page spread in the in the, in the the Daily Sundial, the campus newspaper. And I remember the the... Uh, adjunct professor who's a working photographer just giving us prompts man like this is how you do it you go bust your butt on this and this is great and i was so everything was just pushing me forward now what lit your fire to go let's go let's go to whittier oh man, this was big news this was an earthquake man buildings had you know parts of buildings had right. collapsed i mean this was a pretty good earthquake i'm like well i got this is this is what I'm going to do. And it was I, the biggest one you've lived through yeah, at that point. point right? that yeah, was, this was the one, you know, and uh, of course now every time you, it shakes, you think, is this the one, the yeah, one? the next oh, one. This was a good one. I mean, it cracked streets and buildings, partial buildings came right. down. And Rows there was, of those chimney shots are all dumped exactly. over. Exactly. You know, so we just said, let's just go. 
So, you know, we drove pre, out there. Pre-Google, pre-Maps. Oh, my it's just, goodness. It's just get on Thomas Guide and go. Thomas Brothers, man. You got to live with it. You got to learn how to drive and look at a map and figure out how to get there. And and we did. And we put together a nice set of images and and in the Daily Sundial, which had no ties to Whittier. Right. Ran them. But it was major news. It was major news. And that, you know, again, that's like, that's how you kind of, uh, I, that definitely got my fire lit, you know, there's no doubt. Plus, you know, I was covering sports for the, you know, sundial, which I loved sports, you know, still love it. They did have football back then. They had a a good track program. They had great baseball. Right. Um, In fact, the, the, the uh, coach was renowned at that time. And of course his name slips, slips my mind, but I got a great sports story from the <laughs> daily. It. It's it. actually just after I had graduated. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my boy, George Wilhelm will love this one. I'm going to have to make sure he hears this, <laughs> but I just graduated. I got my first job for six bucks an hour at a small newspaper in Simi Valley, a daily news, a daily afternoon newspaper Ooh, called the Simi top. Valley. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Simi Valley enterprise. And, uh, George Wilhelm had left the enterprise just a year or two maybe before that and gone to the LA Times. And George was and is still, I'm sure, but retired, um, a great sports photographer. And um, he was at the LA Times and I got assigned to shoot a, a CSUN baseball game for the Simi Valley paper and George was there. So we both end up on the first base side and he's kind of on the inside and I'm on the outside and we're both on deadline. It's a Friday night, I remember, Saturday night late afternoon game or something. And um, first or second inning, fly ball to right field, Taylor and foul. Here comes the right fielder. He's digging for it. He's digging for it. We swing the cameras. Boom, he hits the little chain link fence, catches it, flips over the fence. The fence partially comes down. And I'm just laying on the motor, right? And I'm I'm like, (laughs) yes, yes. And I very, very arrogantly <laughs> and dramatically <laughs> folded up my, you know, monopod, looked at George and said, I'm good. I'll see you later, buddy. <laughs> and I left. <laughs> and I went back and I souped my film. Who came walking into that newsroom like two hours later? George Willow. It's like, let me see it, dude. Let me see it. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing here, man? He's like, oh, I live in Simi Valley. You know, I live in Moore Park. Like, let me see the let me see the picture. So I showed him the picture. He's like, he just strolled right in. He strolled right in. He'd worked there for years. So it's yeah, not like he, he didn't know where it was. So he's like, yeah. I, you know, I'm sort of remembering this now. He's probably like, yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> but I had it. Guess what George had? What? Back of my head, man. No! He swung the camera and I was like right there. I was on the outside. He was on the inside. He got the back of my camera in my head. He's got a full head of hair. He's got a full head of hair. (laughs) And you've got that. That was it. Oh, that's brutal. Isn't that good? That's good stuff. Probably the one and only time I could ever beat the guy (laughs) at a sports picture. Well, helping you jump in front of his camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Pretty funny. So that's the bug. That's you're, You're addicted at that point. Oh, yeah. For sure by then. I mean... You know, I take a job for six bucks an hour right. at a daily. But I thought, like, wow, what a what what a fortuitous fortuitous set of events is is I I got the internship when I was a senior only because I'd gone in and uh, was purchasing some film or equipment and the chief photographer for that little paper was in the same little store at the time, Canoga Camera, and um, I introduced myself, uh, said, "Hey, Doug, like." Do you guys need an intern? He's like, yeah, we always need interns. Um, we don't pay anything because we're so small. I said, I, don't, I just need an intern. I want to get some professional experience. I got the internship, right? So I do the internship through senior year. I'm just just rocking it. I'm, I mean, we're talking 40 hours a week. Plus, I'm in school full time. So I'm going, to, I'm, oh. I'm going to school at a 7 o'clock class. And I'm getting out at 10. And I go to the enterprise. And I go like a 10.30 to 7.30 shift. And then I come home and I work Ralph's as a journeyman checker. Because I'd worked my way out through school. Um, till like midnight. So I was le- basically leaving house at about 6 o'clock in the morning. And getting home at like 1 o'clock. Somehow trying to figure out how to study. Um, but they had an opening right when I was graduating. So another photographer left. There was a three person photography staff. And of course they looked at me and said, it's yours if you want it. So I took the job of six sure. bucks an hour. I went from $14 an hour working at Ralph's as a checker to six bucks an hour as a photographer. 
Oh. And I loved it. I didn't even hesitate. No. My, my friends laughed. I specifically remember them literally saying to me, let me get this straight. You go to school, you get a degree, and you take about a 60% cut in pay. I'm like, yeah, what part don't you understand? <laughs> Are you saying I'm stupid or something? What the hell, man? <laughs> I'm a photographer. <laughs> This is, is it. How it works? I'm doing what I want to do, man. This is it, you know. And it was, it was, uh, and you and I have talked about this a little bit. It was a scrap. There was no doubt. I was scrapping from the beginning. I was already with my wife. My wife was was with me from the first, you know, three fifty class. In and, and she didn't go to college. She was working just you know odd jobs at that point. And um, she had a daughter, a young daughter. My wife had a daughter when she was young, and and. I was taking that on. So I graduated. We got married like that same year, like only a couple months later. I got graduated in May. I got married in July and I was making six bucks an hour. She was probably making six bucks an hour, you know, whatever right. it was. And, and we scrapped. We were in our own apartment in Reseda and, and trying to make it work, you know. Wow. But that was good because you know what it does, man? It makes you freaking work hard. Right. You're hungry. You're hungry. Yeah. You, you got to go because... At the end of the day, we got mouths to feed and rent to pay and everything else. Yeah. And I want to make a name. You know, yeah. I want to I want to be the next George, like literally. Right. I mean, he was revered in there. Not the only one. Frank Niemeyer that went oh, on to yes. great success. Yeah. Frank came from the enterprise. So there was a number of photographers that like, I, I, I you know, there's some people here I really respect. Doug Sheridan left the enterprise and went to the Associated Press for a number of years. You know? Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> That really puts the fire under you that you're hungry. You're going to go work. You're going to do whatever it takes. Yeah, so when, absolutely. When you're out working, it is 100%. There's uh, no distraction. There's none. You got it. You got to get it done. You got to work. And, you know, some of the other things you and I have, have, have talked about in the past is, is um, you know, you don't start at the top. I mean, I recognize this. This was a place where I wanted to to. I wasn't going to stay here. No, you know, nobody that's young and eager and hungry has ambition to just, you know, go to the first place and stay there. So I wanted to like work so hard and develop. But on Fridays, Matt, I was the real estate photographer. I mean, that was, I was the, the, the youngest one. So, which meant I had a Polaroid camera. They gave me a list of homes for sale. And I would drive in my Honda Civic, which was the base model with the vinyl seats, roll down windows, and no extra mirror because I couldn't afford those things. Right? People and forget the right hand mirror was extra. extra. Completely extra. Right. Right. So, but it's fine. It was a, you know, it right. worked great. But I would drive up to each house and I'd roll down the window and I'd point my Polaroid out. I'd take it, I'd count to 60, wave the thing, wave it, wave it, wave it, look at it, looked fine. I'd take the Sharpie and I'd write the address down on it. And that's what I did in the afternoon. And a really good day was. I would find some wild art, some freelance picture, because I'm just driving these little streets looking for homes that I have to shoot. And I'd see something funny going on. I'd take a picture that would work itself in the newspaper. But that was hardly, it wasn't glamorous, man. Like, you know, you're not making a name of yourself shooting Polaroids of homes for sale. Right. But that was part of the job. People forget that that's how little papers were back then. There were pets of the week, real estate. Like, you did it all. They didn't send you to the Olympics on your first year. You were grinding from the very bottom of that totem pole to get yourself to the top. A hundred percent. And Pets of the Week is is literally, we had that. Yeah, they, yes. they would bring the pets. I forget which I day it was. I did yes, pets. And, and, they would, and the lobby person would say, hey, there's a Pet of the Week here. Can you come out and shoot it? We'd bring it out in a parking lot. We'd shoot the dog. Right, shoot someone's poodle, yeah, someone's whatever cat, it was. someone's parrot, yeah, whatever. This was just what you did. Yeah. That you know? was that was part of the job, and, and and I do think that there's a lot of that that is still, uh, you know, maybe not pet of the week and all those things per se because of how ads and and you know people post things now differently, but I do believe that you can take that that understanding of grinding like that and accepting that this is part of the job and it's I'm taking a step and I've taught this you know my my wife and I have both you know, really kind of taught this to our son. It's like, as he's starting his career, he's taking a step. He's not where he wants to be, but that's fine. Get on the road. And and, and there might be multiple roads too, Matt. Like there's no judgment. I, you know, if, if you and I are going to roll to the Staples Center right now, you know, you might go down to 405 and I might take, you know, the Beachway. But if we both get there, fine. If you get there first, okay, hey, props. But what's the big deal? We're on our own 
path, right? right? And I think that's really important to me. Um, but I do think that younger photographers can take the idea of what we did grinding back then and apply it to today. No. You know? No, they, they can't. Should. Why not? I, because I think they will look at it as, why, why, why shouldn't I be uh, at, at the Olympics right away? Everybody's told me I'm That's really good. I've got gold stars, and <laughs> awards, and yeah. my mom has my pictures up on the fridge. I'm great. There, there, there <laughs> as as an instructor, I can you know we laugh. There is you know there is, but there is some truth to that. There yeah. really is. There is a lot of um, over. Uh, <sighs> You know, it's kind of like everybody gets the award type thing. There, there is a lot of that that goes on. Um, and again, as a, as an adjunct, as a, as a parent, I've, I've cautioned against that. You know, um, when my son screwed things up, I've told him, nah, man, bad choice. You know, bad choice, just whatever, right. bad choice. I made plenty of them, buddy. Um, just learn from it, okay? But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Um, and I, and I do think that. Um, there are a number of photographers that think they need to start at the top or if they're going to get someplace that they should be getting those premier assignments and so forth. But that's not really how it works. And if you have a better understanding of let me get out there and prove myself with my photographs, then um, hopefully those assignments are going to be made available to you. Right. Like when you're graduating from CSUN, you were not expecting the New York Times to come in, pluck you and say, hey, Todd. We're going to take care of you from now for the next 40 years. No. No. You weren't, you weren't even a blip on the radar yet. You had to grind. Kids today, and I, I hate to crap on them all the time, but they're expecting the New York Times to call. You know, there could be 1% or 2% of them. Right. You know, and, and, and there, there's for some- every Marcus Yam. Right. Who actually built his way great up. Great example. There's a thousand. Right. That don't even get the job at a small town Pennsylvania right. newspaper. Right. And, but- and, and let's take even one more step back. Uh, how many of them are willing to um, leave home and go take that small job that is 3,000 right. miles away or 2,500 in a town that perhaps they've never even heard of right. to get that experience? I would not only encourage it if it was my student or if my son was going in, in that direction, I would not only encourage it, I would say embrace it for a number of reasons. One, the experience. Two, the adventure, man. Oh, absolutely. Like adventure. This is like part of what we can do that, you know, the accountant can't do. Nope. <laughs> the accountant can't goes to the office with the pencil, okay? Right. Not to make fun of it or the computer. But the reality is we are rich with experiences as photographers. Embrace that opportunity to get outside of your of your comfort, comfort zone and there might be some anxiety of being 23 years old and moving to a town where you know nobody and all those things. But you'll get over it in like two days, man. Like you'll figure out the brew pub that's fun to go to. You'll 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 make some friends. Like embrace that. But I, I think there's a little bit of a hesitancy of taking that first step because they might, they, you know, just using general right. term for young photographers, they might think, oh, I'll do that for the New York Times or the Washington Post or, you know, pick any big Miami Herald right. or something. But I'm not going to do it for the Toledo Blade or I'm not going to do it for the, you know, Indianapolis Star or so, you know, which wasn't even a small paper. But, right. um, you know, why not? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you go to Topeka and work right. knowing the rich history of photojournalism that came from that? Right. Embrace that. And there's two things from that. There is there's something to be said about being in a small town newspaper. There's photos that could be made that will absolutely put you apart from everybody else in a newspaper portfolio review. If you know how to shoot in the snow, if you're shooting cowboys in Wyoming, you're not going to get that in Miami if that's where you grow up or or if you're in the Great Lakes or something where you're absolutely being exposed to different photos. And then being thrown into something where you're 100% immersed and you're not distracted by your buddies in the valley. Oh, my God, the advantages you have. That is, I, you, you put it perfectly. I mean, that's how I've thought of it 100 times over. And I know through my own, you know, 27, 28 years, 30 years of freelance experience that I've made it as a freelancer because of those early years of exactly what you described, because I had to know how to go out and shoot a portrait and come back from that portrait and be told by the managing editor, we need a, free, a, a feature picture, a wild art picture for the afternoon deadline. And I would have 30 minutes to run out, find a photograph, come back, soup that film, get it 
drop the print on the desk, run back out the door to go shoot the Simi Valley High School baseball game right. or, or JV soccer game, girls soccer, right. and come back from that and then go to a breaking news fire because Simi Valley was in the hills. And, right. and I mean, you develop so many attributes that are applicable to freelancing. The ability to you know uh, adjust on the fly, to shoot many different things. Absolutely. And then outside of all of the, the technical and, and, and work-related skills, you do like get to go to a new part of a country and just like experience what you say, like, wow, I've never been in, lived in the snow. Right. Like I've been to the snow, you know, but I've never lived in it. It's a different experience and totally. you're going to make different images and you're going to experience life differently. Yeah. And, and I think we should embrace that. I don't think that I, 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 maybe, maybe it's just me. But I, I do have a fair amount of access to students, not just my students, but at workshops and so forth, where I think there's a little bit less adventurism. In them. Right. <laughs> they're not they quite as adventurous. They pretend they're adventurous on Instagram, <laughs> but they don't want to do it. Yeah, man. Get on a bus and, uh, you know, go travel through some country and just take pictures for like six months after graduation and come back. And if you can't get somebody interested in them, then produce your own little book. Right. You know? Do you remember flipping through? Maybe you were an MPPA member, maybe you weren't. But Always, do you remember yeah. looking through the and seeing the job listings? Always. And yeah. going, where is that in Kansas? Yeah. Where is that in I Iowa? Did. Yeah. Billings, Montana. Right. And going, hmm, hmm. they got a job opening for right. an internship or a job. Right. All the time. Oh my God. I was doing it all the time as a young photographer. I would love to be all in Billings, Montana right now. Let me let me tell you, like, so after three and a half years at that first newspaper, I was I was hungering for more. And I'd been to the ad I'd applied and been accepted to the third Eddie Adams workshop, which okay. I thought was a little bit of a uh, affirmation that I had some talent and ability um, because it was very difficult to get into it. And I went back there and I and I, you know, had a lot of reviews. Some of them went great, some of them did not go great. But when I got back, I decided I'm going to give this a go. And I contacted the Hartford Current. And I said, listen, you know, um, I know some people, I saw them at the workshop. Do you think you could really use somebody out there? And they said, well, we can't guarantee anything, but, you know, we we always hire good freelancers. We packed it up, man. We packed it up. I had no guarantee, and I went to the Hartford Current. And I freelanced basically like most freelancers were doing in those days. If you were good, you were going to get five days a week. And I was working four and five days wow. a week all the time. Okay, so ho hold on. No how, guarantee at all. How did that conversation go? It went, right? You yeah. got a wife, is a wife or girlfriend at the time? Wife? No, we were married, time, yeah. And you go, honey. And a stepdaughter. And a daughter, right? Yeah. And you're going like, uh, I'd like to pack up the two of you ladies and go cross country, <laughs> not to Arizona, no, man. but uh, 3,000 miles. 3,000. Yeah. Well, the Hartford Current was like. But how know, did that conversation go? That uh, man, I mean, I owe so much to my wife. I mean, she's just, and she's not only so supportive, she's real, man. And and that's why 30, almost 32 years of marriage. She has, believes in you. She believes in me. And, and also she, she's Italian, so she'll say what's on her mind, <laughs> which is, you have to have, yes. you have to have she's it, your man. Best photo she's my, her. oh yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. crap. I don't like anything that she picks. <laughs> But she's a very good photo editor. <laughs> but that's normal, right? right because what right. I've never liked anything any photo editor's ever picked. <laughs> but whatever. But um, that conversation was very. I, I mean, I think it was. We were did you have to sell it? I don't think so. I, I don't recall that at all. I literally said, "Look, I think I think this will be good. Let's get out of here for a while. Let's see where it goes. There's no guarantees if it doesn't work." So what she was, she had found a job. Um, uh, by responding to an ad in the newspaper for an operator at Pacific Bell. Okay. The 411 operators. You and I remember these. You would call 411 on your landline. You'd say, and the operator would pick up and say, uh, city and, and what was listing? it? City, city and listing, yeah. please. And you'd say, uh, West Hills, Todd Bigelow. And they'd look up your number and they'd give it to you. Connecting. Uh, connecting. Yeah. Right. Right. And uh, so crazy. So, 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 you know, she had that job at that time. And um, we thought, okay, let's check into a leave of apps. Can you take a leave? Like, because if I, what, what if I go back to Hartford and literally like they never hire me? Right. 
Okay, I got it. I got it. 60 days in, you've yeah, got one job. Right? So at least she had this job as an operator. So they gave her a leave of absence. And they said, you got one year, basically, where you can come back and still have your job. It's Okay, that was it. That was all we needed. So uh, we went back. I went ahead of her. She packed up uh, with my stepdaughter and so forth and waited for her to get done with school and came back. And I went back there and I was blessed by great editors that saw gave me a chance and um, I responded every time the beeper went off. <laughs> right, Literally, I right. responded. And, um, you know, at first I had a, a little extra bed, you know, in a, in a tenement home that <laughs> in Rhode Island, which was about 30, 40 minutes away from the office and so forth. But anyways, I just, you know, it worked out really well. It was, I was blessed. That's and an adventure. It though. was an adventure. And that's how we looked at it. That's, that's part of what adventure. we wanted to talk about. If my wife was here, she'd tell you, even on the, she took it as an adventure on the way back. And she, you know, zigzagged across the country and went to Grace Landing. <laughs> She's right. a big Elvis fan and right. all that type of stuff. So yeah, it was an adventure. In fact, it was such an adventure that a hurricane hit when we were there. And we're from California. It's like, okay, I remember hurricanes because I have family in Rhode Island and I happen to have been there once, but I had to go out and shoot. So I was like, honey, I think you're supposed to put some water in the bathtub or something I'm like oh, I'll I gotta go like yeah. you guys see you later and um yeah so you know what man we lived in like a extended stay type of hotel like that was for working people that were living a long time like a almost like a corporate hotel right you know and she was cooking on hot plates and stuff because wow. we weren't we wouldn't want to commit too much at first until we figured out how long it, it would work sure and after uh, about six months, had an opportunity to return, and uh, the Hartford Current was owned by Times Mirror, and the LA Times was hiring a number of freelancers, and I heard that they possibly would be interested. And well, I re how, reached how was out. your growth at Hartford? I, I did I, that give you growth? Did it you did. feel like it you really did, were blossoming in a different way? It did, and, and shout out to Brad Clift and Shana Surek and, and a number of, and my buddy Tim Rasmussen, who we were freelancers together. Right. You know, Tim, who's gone on to just do great stuff throughout his career, and it's hired me at places where he was a director and so forth. Um, and um, yeah, Tim and I drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you don't mind me saying it. <laughs> hey, we're young freelancers, yeah. right? That's what you do. You yes. get off work. You like, you know, you there, was a, there was a dive bar right next to the Hartford Current, man. You spilt beer and greasy burgers and it was just so good. And they're all cheap. And that's what and you I filled didn't yourself know these up. guys yeah. when I went. So it was like, this was part of the adventure. I was making new friends. And, but the direction. But you're making lifelong friends. I did. And I, and I'm still, I still stay in contact with these people and, and I drew and such inspiration from them. Right. And that's a networking angle. Kids don't understand. Completely. It's big. It's huge. And, and it's such a great point, Matt. One, I do. I just told my students that last week that, you know, I have to remind them your network while you're a student starts with your professors. And if you have Good professors that have stayed, you know, relevant in the profession, they should be able to help you. Yes. Okay. From the Hartford Current, once I left and I returned, the Hartford Current's uh, photo editor at the time, he might have had a different title, Fred Barnes, went on to the Sporting News. Guess wow. what? Wow. Guess what? Guess who started shooting for the Sporting News? Not because I actually specifically went out and sought the Sporting News, but Fred needed work done in, in the L.A. area. Before you knew it, I was flying all over shooting Steve Young and Terry Bradshaw and, you know, up and down the coast and doing really nice portrait shoots and, 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 and other types of shoots for, uh, uh, you know, a, a sporting publication, which I love to do, that was paying magazine rates. Right. And that was only because of the network that I had made by you know, taking that step and, and going that next direction. And you never know. And I, you know, I, I can't say that at that, when I was at Hartford, that that particular editor was, you know, constantly praising me, not in any way. Right. Never, never was it like right. that. You know, I, I kept my head down and I worked hard. I watched what some of them were doing, the staffers, which were just producing phenomenal work. And I was, again, the fire was just burning and burning. Right. Just throwing coal on it. That's it. That's it. And I think... That kind of experience, if you hadn't had it, would have set you back. Like you don't get those 
battle scars, right? That experience. Like if you don't go to Hartford, it's kind of like, okay, maybe Todd's two years behind being at Hartford for what, what were you there a year? Uh, not even like uh, six to nine months, six to nine months jump started you two or three years ahead. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight, yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely true. You know, and, so and big. It, it is, you have to be willing to take risks in this profession, whether, especially now as a free, as a freelance dominated profession. But, you know, I just, I had done my three and a half years at the, at the, small newspaper. It was great. I, man, I learned so much and I did, I, I, I pitched my own projects and I had a lot of control over what I could do and I really developed, but it was time for a change. Right. You know, and, and, and I, I get, and that's it, okay. That's okay. It should be embraced, you know, right. and, and, and if you're, if you're looking to be comfortable and not worry, then this is probably not the profession anyways. No. Really, honestly, no, it's not. not, not, not to, not to like, you know, rain on anybody's parade, but this is not the type of job where you can be guaranteed that 30 years from now, you're going to be making the same money or more. Uh, and, and there's no change in the business. And there's no and change. Yeah. And everybody's happy and it's vanilla. No, it's, no. it's not. And, and some will say, well, that's new. It's it, it wasn't like that before. No, it was like that before. We You you had to accept the unpredictability of of what this profession called for, you know, of, of the midnight calls or finding out that something's going on and you got to just go do it. You know, I've missed every major holiday there is basically. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I dropped off my, as a freelancer, this is fast forward in many years, but you know, I'm supposed to, supposed to go to San Diego for my son's ninth birthday. And we were packed up, man. And then I got the call from People Magazine to head to the airport if I could, because they want to uh, put me on a flight to Katrina. A couple of days after Katrina had hit, they were putting together like 10 teams of writers and photographers and, you know, kind of bad pun intended, but flooding the area to go in and, and tell the, the next generation of stories, like right. the next magazine stories of the heroics and the people and so forth. And I looked at my wife and I said, I got to go do this. And they completely understood. And, you know, they went off and had a great time in San Diego, but. And you spent what week to. Yeah, it was about a week. Yeah. yeah. Eight, seven, eight days. Yeah. Right. And those are the jobs. You just got to do it. Right. Yeah. You embrace it. And, and it, you're sad. I mean, I look, man, right. it's my son. You know, I want to be with him on his birthday and right. I love him. And I spent, but I, I changed my career for him anyways, you know, so that I could be around as much as possible by leaving newspapers and going into magazines. But, um, you know, it, it's hard, but you got to do it. Right. And you had a good partner that was understood. A hundred percent. Because there's no way it happens. You, yeah. you have to have a great partner in this career. If you're going to have a partner, they better be a great partner. Right. It's, it's, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm, I'm totally blessed by that. Um, if you're going to go out it alone, you don't have to run your choices by anybody, nope. you know, but, um, everything has been done in, in with, with a complete respect and understanding that we each have, you know, for one another. When I left the LA times as a, as a contract photographer, it was because my wife got pregnant. And they were slowly, I was already inching towards wanting to make that two footed leap into the magazine world. I had already been whittling my contract down at the LA times as I began to pick up work from time and newsweek and us news and some other public and sporting news and some right. other publications. And I was kind of almost on that. Do I do this? Do I not do this? The times is a very like guaranteed thing. Mm -hmm. Like I can, you know, I can work as much as I want basically. And when she got pregnant, um, it was a question of, I didn't have uh, benefits from the LA Times. As a contractor, they didn't give us benefits. Nope. Yep. So my wife did. So I said, I, you know, he's not going to be alone. You know, I grew up alone. You grew up alone. It didn't always lead to good things. So I said, I want to do this magazine thing. What do you think? How about we do it this way? How about you stick with Pac Bell. Um, she worked two miles down the road. She could work a split shift so she could come home in the middle of the day and be with, with our young son and all make a foray towards the magazines full time. And, um, that way, because those who don't really understand the difference in how they work as a freelancer, you get less work from magazines because it's not a daily newspaper right. with 20 different assignments in it every day. Um, but you make more money and it, it you know, I would venture to say, especially at that time, there's a little bit more prestige with, you know, shooting for a time in a news week, um, at least with what I wanted to do. And um, we agreed to, to make that to make that leap. So we did it out of like a discussion about what's best 
overall for the family and everything. Right. So when I wasn't out shooting and, and client developing from home and so forth, you know, my son's on my lap, right? My son's on my lap and I'm literally sending emails and, uh, you know, working with my agency at the time, black star and, and, and oh, so forth. Black star. Yeah. 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 So that you hear about that opportunity in LA. So you guys decide, okay, LA times has got some opportunities for some, some contractors mm -hmm. pack up everybody and you head back mm -hmm. to LA and That's here it. we come the Valley. Yeah. And I actually <laughs> kind of started out getting more work from the Ventura County edition. Yeah, of course you yeah, did. With, um, Which people forget there were, used to be a lot of we LA had times editions, editions all over. We had Ventura, we had the Valley, we had Orange County were San the three Diego? majors in San Diego, right, right? Were the four majors exactly. It was blanketed. Yeah, and I mean at many points we you know we were like, you know, for the Northridge earthquake, man, you know, we the the LA Times itself what a breaking news Pulitzer and uh you know uh uh Myself and, and uh, Jonathan were on the front page of the Pulitzer for, you know, that 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 series that they won it for. We didn't win individuals, um, but we won, uh, you know, as a team, part of a team. But, you know, the L.A. the L.A. Times Valley Edition, you know, obviously we were on scene because that Northridge earthquake in 94. It was Walking a valley. Through man. That, where were you that day? I was at Ground Zero, man. I lived at Ground Zero. Like, I was in a condo. We lived, my wife and I and my stepdaughter, we were in a condo. Actually, she was at her grandma's that night, but we were in a condo at Satakoy in Tampa. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and it hit, and we knew, man. So you're sleeping like a baby, and all hell breaks Boom, loose. Boom, it breaks loose, and uh, my wife helps me push everything off of my uh, car, my Honda Civic, still. Still. <laughs> How come I didn't upgrade by that point? I don't know, but it still worked. It still why. worked. Yeah, no, literally, like okay, it's like, like a good why, tripod. Why? Still why works. get rid of it? It's yeah. paid for. So uh, pushed everything off. It's four thirty in the morning, and uh, first thing I do is I head towards uh, where my parents live, and I go by a Marriott. Uh, in Woodland Hills, and they're all outside in bed sheets. So I start, I make a couple of images, quickly run to my parents, they're okay. From there, the valley is dark, so I see glowing in the distance. It turns out it's Northridge. So I get on uh, and I start flying back towards Northridge because we lived literally like a mile and a half from where the the, the, it's called the Northridge earthquake, but Epicenter was actually uh, Reseda. How are the roads at that point? Let me tell you. I, I, I could have died um, had I, by the grace of God, the, the, the freeway overpass didn't, or the, the railroad overpass didn't buckle, but I never, it never, I never thought of it at the time. So I'm going over a railroad tracks where there's an overpass on Nordoff and uh, Tampa. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. there's an overpass there and I'm flying because I see that I'm just flying, driving this little, you know, uh, Honda Civic as fast as I can and the gears in the back. And it's all like just laying in the back in bags and stuff. And there's, it's dark. It's just pitch dark. And as I, as I'm flying up this, my headlights catch that the thing had buckled. It, but it buckled up. The bridge overpass buckled up. I hit that thing so hard that I launched my Civic. And it comes down. I thought, oh, gosh, don't flip. It comes down, like, on my front bumper. I'm, like, you know, diagonally down. And I bounce off the other side. My gear comes flying forward. I bust my strobe off of my cannon. It literally snaps off the hot shoe because I had already taken pictures. And I get over to where the fires are burning in Northridge and I pull up right when a long time kind of breaking news spot photographer legend in the valley, Gene Blevins for the LA Daily News is pulling up. And I didn't really know him well and I for, will forever remember him for this. And I'm like, oh man, dude, I almost, almost, my car almost went off this thing and buckled and I snapped, snapped my flash off the hot shoe and oh man, it's dark. He gave me a flash. He's like, here, take this, Todd. And I was like, whoa, man, you're saving me. I had one other, but I have multiple bodies, right? Right. Like, thanks, Gene. And, 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 and fires were burning and people were running with buckets to throw water on condos that were on, on fire. So that was kind of, kind of crazy. But yeah, the roads were, were nuts. I, for, if, if that, if that overpass had, had dropped like the 14 freeway had, yes. I would have gone right off it. It never even occurred to me I'm driving over an overpass. Right. I'm just hell bent on getting to because where I needed to go. That became like one of the iconic photos. That, that overpass. Poor that was the top picture right. by Jonathan Alcorn. 
yeah. on the next day's paper. Mine was the bottom picture of A1, which was the collapsed buildings at at Northridge Meadows Apartments next to Northridge University. And I had firefighters crawling into the pancaked first floor trying to pull survivors out. And in the foreground, if I recall correctly, was the mother of one of the ones that had died, a young kid that had died. And that was the front picture was like the legs of the or the bottom picture that was mine, the legs of the firefighter trying to pull people out of the pancake and uh, the mother kind of waiting anxiously. When something like that happens, do you make that decision? Okay, I'm going with color neg or... Did you only have black and white? Like, how prepared were you, like, every night before you go to bed for the next assignment? Um, great question. Um, we were color neg at that point at the Times. Okay. Um, so I, I was shooting color neg. The problem that, that not problem, but the, the concern for me was I was already shooting for uh, the magazines. Okay. And um, including some pretty pretty big stories and so forth. So I was very uh, on the radar of Time Magazine's West Coast photo editor, Martha Bardak. Yes, and, yes. Yeah, I knew Martha well. She treated me really well. And, and um, so I would often be ready, of course, like for whatever I'd have gear, you know, ready. Okay. But magazines, we were shooting chromes. Mm -hmm. So if I was shooting chromes and I was working for the Times, um, so, uh, but I had neck and I was supposed to be working for the times that day. So I, I opted to go to work and, and honor that obviously. And, and, and it was the right thing to do anyways. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's just one of those days you're glad you had your film and you yeah. went down to like two rolls and you're like, I'll right. pick up a brick right. tomorrow right. or I've got my, you know, right. cameras together. You weren't taking your stuff in to go get, you know, fixed. Right. To this day, it still uh, it still res resonates with me because you want to make sure your batteries are charged. Um, we still live in earthquake country, knock on wood. Um, you want to make sure that you have enough gas in your car. So one of the things that uh, with the LA Times is a bunch of staffers, obviously from downtown, that work out of the main office. Everybody rolled out to the valley because this is, I mean, right. it, there was damage in Santa Monica all over. Everybody's working everywhere. But we had a big portion of the um, you know work being done in the valley. We were siphoning gas from those that had uh, gas in the staffer cars, uh, literally the old fashioned way, right. tube in, suck on the tube, get it going and pour it into a can, take that can and put it into our, because the gas stations were shut down. Sure. Yeah. 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 There's a day you don't want to be on E. Yeah. You don't want to be, I can't go anywhere. I. <laughs> Did you have a cell phone by then or no? Yeah. I think we had car phones. I think I had the one mounted in the car. Okay. Yeah. And that Honda Civic. Yeah. <laughs> it was Air, more valuable than yeah, the car. Air touch. Yeah. Oh, I covered it. Oh yeah. You had to cover it. Yeah. Definitely. Who's going to, and you only gave out your number to very limited people yes. because it was a very expensive thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you worked that thing for what, a couple of days? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We were on that. Yeah. And then it, you know, kind of, you know, push, started pushing into projects and so forth. Do you have a little bit more emotion because it's at home? It was very hard. Yeah. I, I did cry that first night. Uh, laying on the floor of a of a friend um, who lived around the corner because our our condo we, we weren't sure it was safe. Our friend had a house uh, a street over, and about five of us slept in there, and we were sleeping on the floor, and it was constantly rattling. I think I was going through a little bit of shock, you right. know. Uh, it wasn't like I was crying out of fear. It was just kind of like this, wow, like what's you know what's going on? I don't know if my you know what's going to happen with my parents' home and all this type of stuff, and. Um, but yeah, it was it, it, it was emotional. It yeah, was emotional. Man, it's got to be. It's a, it was emotional. Yeah. You've been now working for God knows how many hours. Yeah, physically and yeah, mentally, we, just drained. Yeah, we were drained. The emotional, the emotional drain of it when it happens close to home. Yeah, is and, different. And you know places. Oh, that business. It was a university. I mean, right. this was my alma mater too, and I'd already right. been teaching over there. I mean, it was it was basically destroyed. Yes. I mean, Cal State Northridge, you know, big portions of it collapsed. It took it in the shorts. It yeah, got completely absolutely. wrecked. So it was, you know, it was, it was difficult to see that. And of course, on a personal level, like all of my friends and everybody we were now dealing with, Matt, we had just purchased our home. I was two weeks into escrow when it hit. Oh. So on top of everything else, it's like, okay, what I have to find time to try to go look at the house that we're in escrow on. Yeah. My house might be flat. Yeah. Which isn't technically even my house yet. 
you know, we were two weeks into escrow. On it. Oh, yeah. So I added stress on top of that. <laughs> so, which it turned out to be okay. I mean, they built it, you know, somewhat strongly, I guess. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so, and it had been a foreclosure. We bought a foreclosure in a vacant house because in 94, there had been a recession. And, you know, let's be real, like as a photographer, you're never going to get rich, man. And this was an opportunity to buy a house. So we bought the worst house in the little neighborhood we wanted to live in and small and we still live in it. And, uh, you know, paid for, you know, very little for it because it was just destroyed. My wife wouldn't even use the bathrooms the two weeks we were working on it before we had to move in. And, and, um, you know, but it was, it was the right price. Right. <laughs> it was and, the right it's price. a great investment, you know, but it, but it, but obviously the stress of that was enough to like kind of overwhelm you at time. It's like, I'm shooting. I got all these things, this huge earthquake the, the it's still rolling. People who haven't lived through an earthquake like that, the, you know, the ground rolls for, for months and months. Right. There's after shocks you know, and all the time. And then just the visual aftershocks of like, Oh, that store's not there anymore. Oh, they got to rebuild the 14. The, Everything. This. And it went on for a while. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, that was man. crazy. Now, you covered you covered a lot of good, I hate to say good, but interesting things in the, that period of time because you also covered the riots. Yes. Yeah. How was that? That, again, was, you know. That was a bonkers riot compared to what we had in May. Right. Because there hadn't been one since the Watts riots. So this right. was Real. This was real. Pre social yeah, I mean, media. So there was no right. Look at me. I'm I'm at Vine and you know, right. Hollywood. Right. This was this was definitely um real in the sense that there had not really been any other big civil unrest, especially in LA, but even throughout the country a lot. Right. Um prior to the 94 riots with the exception of the Watts riots. So the fact that this was occurring was, you know, obviously huge international news. We've had a lot of civil unrest since then, but um, that, that time span did make the 94, uh, 92 riots a, a, a very stressful, you don't really know kind of how to navigate it. Um, not something they teach you in J school. Yeah, they don't. So, they don't. Yeah. And I, again, I was at the LA times as a, as a young, uh, early in my contract. Um, and, uh, the, for those who don't know, that the trial was held in Simi Valley, which is a very um, affluent white suburb, um, demographically speaking. And they uh, the jury was drawn from that and they were acquitted. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, w I watched that occur on television as far as an uh, acquittal. And then immediately, um, you know, uh, there were reports of, of unrest happening in, in the city. And um, so I got in my car, told the Times I'm heading down and, and um, you know, just went and started shooting. <laughs> Not too much you can do. I mean, again, you're shooting with film. Um, it got to be night. Um, so you're having to pop flash a lot. You got to remember, this is not days where you could you know, if you could push to 3,200, maybe 6,400, if you're still shooting black and white, uh, right. Yeah. You could get by with it. But for the most part, you're going to have to pop a flash and, um, you know, popping a flash in the middle of civil unrest at night is, is sort of like, uh, you know, putting a target on yourself. Yes. So you had to be very uh, aware of how you're shooting, where you're shooting. Did you go out by yourself or did you I team did. up? No, I was out by myself. Um, uh, let me take that back. I started by myself somehow. Boy, you're touching on some things that I haven't thought about, man. <laughs> and you're actually going to get some nuggets out of this. Good. I ended up with one of my favorite authors, one of the best writers of mystery in the world, I think, Michael Connolly. What? <laughs> Michael Connolly was a staff writer at the LA Times. Yes, I don't yeah. even remember how we ended up together, but we ended up spending several hours driving through Hollywood together on wow. the first night of the riots. Yeah. I've reminded him of that on Twitter every now and then. I'll, I'll post, like, oh, yeah, I was with Michael Connolly on this. Um, I just such a great that. writer. I did portrait with him a couple years ago. <laughs> did you really? Yeah, yeah well, like, probably because hey. of his show Bosch. Yeah. Or, he's such a, he was such a great guy. Such a phenomenal writer at the, even, at, you know, way back in the 90s. He was a phenomenal writer at the LA yeah. Times. Um, and again, I don't even know how I, I mean, I first went to Parker Center, which is kind of right. the, the, where things Ground are starting zero. off. And then, yeah, and then just kind of went out and about and ended up in Hollywood where there were torch of buildings. And, well, that's the safe thing. Yeah. Get someone to, I can watch yeah. your back, you watch mine. Yeah, yeah. 
Because yeah, to go definitely. out on your own. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, again, that, that was my first big civil unrest. Right. I mean, again, there was not a lot of that going on at the time. So didn't have much experience at it. Uh, in hindsight, yes, I would try to make that, um, you know, try to make that a situation now going forward. How long did you work that? Uh, mostly through that night. Uh, and then the next day I was on in the valley. Um, I was scheduled, so I had to come to work in the valley. And, and, and then I ended up uh, back downtown when they deployed the national guard. Okay. Um, yeah. and I did, that was more of like, just kind of, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say featureized with it, but, but let's see how the national guard is working. And they were, you know, going down certain streets and kind of, you know, trying to get calm back into the city. So, uh, you know, when young Wan and others were down there, you know, uh, literally hiding behind cars with Korean store owners, you know, trying to, you know, getting incredible images. Those of you who don't know Young Wan's work at the LA Times during the riots, it was incredible. Look it up. Yeah, look it up. It was incredible, incredibly brave, courageous work at a, at a very dangerous time. Um, uh, I wasn't a part of that. Um, I was shooting other things that first night and then uh, was working in the Times uh, Valley edition where things were, you know, trying to spread a little bit out into various areas. So we had to make sure we were covering all that. And again, to draw back to some of the things we were talking about, you know, if you're going to be a photographer and you're going to be on a team, uh, whether staff or a contract, you know, um, I wasn't the big fish, man. You know, I mean, I'm not going to be told like we need Todd down there. I mean, you right. know, you, you have, you know, you they're had sending a, Gary. Yeah. They're sending Gary and Kirk McCoy and, Kirk, they, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, young one and, and, and a lot, and a lot of the people that were based in the, in the downtown and Al Saib and, you know, in Anna Clado and, you know, these people that are just these are phenomenal photographers. Right. So like, you know, I got down there because I wasn't scheduled when the verdict came down and I told the times I'm going They're <laughs> great. Hey, another body, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, when I had to go on my shift, I couldn't be, I couldn't be that guy that said, Hey, I'm not going, this is too big. I'm, you know, you guys have been taking care of me for, for a year and a half. Thanks a lot, but I'm doing this for me, you know, boom, that's right. not how it works. So, so they put you in that support role, which yeah, is, I went to a needed. support role. Yeah, absolutely. And I still had opportunities but still to make images. a big story. Absolutely. When the national guard comes in, it's a, now a bigger story. Absolutely. Absolutely. And need That's, someone there. And and I did what I was asked to do. Right. You know, and make Team the player. best pictures I can. Yeah. Yeah. So you work in that thing. Yeah, absolutely. You don't bitch and moan. I want to be. No way. You know, where the bullets are flying. No way. Because you don't know where those bullets will start flying and <laughs> something like that. It's crazy, but. Yeah. It could have gotten ugly and you don't know. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I've, I've read enough and talked to enough people that have, have far more conflict experience than I will ever have. Uh, but I, I do have a little bit of conflict experience. And when I went over to, uh, Croatia and Serbia, when the war was going, um, you know, I was told, just remember that you'll, you'll, you'll feel like you, you just can't wait. You got to get to the front lines. And then once you get to the front lines, you can think, oh my God, how do I get out of here? Right. <laughs> like, I can't wait to get out of this situation. I mean, let's talk um, about that. Cause that was what I wanted to touch on. Like, why do you think at that point, like, I want to go do that? Because it, you know, you're married, you have children, right. you have responsibilities. I love James Knockway to death, but right. he's not, he doesn't have a family. Yeah. And he, you, you know, Again, where's that conversation go? That conversation was uh, very much with my wife was, hey, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look to try to find a way to tell a story of what's going on over in Croatia and Bosnia and Serbia. And it, it was fairly not early in the war, but the war had pretty much ravaged Croatia, which is where it began in a, in a little town called Vukovar in Osijek and all these right. uh, little uh, areas um, outside of Zagreb, yeah, more along the border with Serbia. And um, I, I told her I felt I wanted to do this. Internally, Matt, it was a challenge for me because I wanted, I had already been to the Eddie Adams workshop. I had not only been as a student, I was asked by Eddie uh, to come back and, and participate as one of the black team members, which is now legendary, but few of us were the ones that kind of helped form this legendary status. <laughs> Tim, Tim Rasmussen and Gene Pierce, Gene Pierce, which is Bill Pierce's son and, and myself and a number of others and really great people. Um, and because of that, I sat through a lot of 
looking at work by the Turnley brothers and Chris Morris and, and these people. And it's like, wow, man, this is like, I got to do this. Like everybody has to go do this. And it's not that I really felt like this was my calling. I, I, I if anything, I kind of knew it wasn't because my photography has always tended to be more, I want to explore a little bit more. It's not always been like the hard news. I like kind of the f- take take a, a hard news topic and find a way to tell it. Perhaps it is not necessarily the daily news way. Okay. Uh, meaning like the daily news coverage way. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I did some research and Croatia, uh, I'm sorry, Croatians, the largest population of them at that time is in San Pedro. What? And in Los Angeles. That was the largest population of Croatians and former Yugoslavians. They were relocating to San Pedro in Los Angeles. So I, I thought, okay, here's, here's where I can try to find somebody. I found a guy from the Valley who was going to be returning to his town of Osijek. His wife was a doctor and had decided to stay through the war, through the fighting. And I, uh, Steve Appleford and I, who is a great writer and photographer, by the way, uh, I, I went to him and we, we fleshed this idea out and we took it to the LA Times and I said, I want to go do this. <laughs> it just got slammed. It's like some boy from the Valley is not going and doing international work. You know, who are you guys? You don't, this is what we called like, you don't go to the foreign desk and like say, hey, I want to go over to a war zone. They're going to be, cute idea. yeah, they're going to be like, who are you, kid? You know, yeah. you beat it. And, you know, which is, we we're kind of looking to see if there would be interest in this story because we're going to tell the story. The idea was to tell the story through the local guy. This is this is an age old way for newspaper photographers yes, to find their way yes. to an international job. <laughs> find the local <laughs> angle, pitch it, make it a good pitch, and you're going to go do and the get job. There. Right. right. And so I, I knew this. I'd done it somewhat before. So um, they were they were uh, accepting of it in the valley. No one was saying like you're going to be on assignment. You're going to do this because there was you know legal and insurance reasons and sure. all this type of stuff. So I'm not looking for any of that. We just made the reservations. I said, the, the guy loved the idea. I followed him home. Steve and I followed him home to his war-torn town. And and we just spent a few weeks um, with him and then finding ancillary stories to tell. And the Times blew it out, man. When we got back, it was front page with like multiple jump page spreads inside. It was really, uh, I was super thrilled by it. Now, from the business side, when you approach LA Times, do you say, hey, can you cover flight expenses or are they looking at like when you come back we'll take a look at that time so it was a a little bit different because i'm navigating kind of two different worlds so i i've been full freelance since like the mid 90s right i'm not tied to anybody at that time i was a contract person with the la times so i was going to go do this on my own time Mm. So that was the difference. It's like, okay, I, I'm not getting sent there. That's clear. There's no way foreign desk is going to sign off on that. And, and something similar when I went to Mexico and, you know, they're like, oh, you're not with us, you know? Okay. Right. No problem. I understand. Um, so what we did is we decided, let's, Steve and I, let's go do this, this story. Let's go crank out some stuff. We'll, we'll sell a piece. We sold one to the Chicago Tribune. Um, we came back and we negotiated some fair fees um, from the LA Times. So they, they came through and um, got, you know, we got our, we got our time covered. We got our expenses covered. Um, I didn't make a lot of money, but man, I, you know, I did what I wanted to do and, and I produced, I thought, which was a good story. It was, it was not, I was not, uh, be very clear. I mean, there was plenty of gunfire going on sure. at night and stuff. And I heard plenty of things and we went and bombed out buildings and all this stuff, but I, I never felt threatened, but that wasn't the story I was going to tell because others were already telling that story. Yeah. I, I wasn't out to find the front line. I was out to, f- what was it like to live in a war zone? What was it like to try to carry on life in a war zone? And Steve came up with a great uh, story about how the nightlife was coming back and he had a lot of ties to the music industry. So we found this, there was going to be like this concert in this bombed out building in Osiak and uh, like a, you know, like a town concert type thing in there. And it was, and literally like we did this whole little separate thing. I'm like, you know, the nightlife coming back to, to, um, this, this war torn town on, you know, that it's separated from the former Yugoslavia. <laughs> and, and we, it, that was one that he, I think Steve handled that pitch to the, to the Tribune and, you know, we, we had some images running that. Now, so it's different today, right? If you and I are going to go, we're, 
going off the cover. We make sure we got cards, hard drives. We could back up, push to the cloud. But then you got to make sure what? You got enough film, cameras. Like, where are you logistically thinking? If I shoot through all my 200 rolls, do I have more? Where am I storing my film? Where does that logistical idea start running through your head going for and land? Yeah, if anything, that's where most of the anxiety usually come, came from. You know, um, the, the, the logistics of it was not easy because um, those of us that remember with film, um, uh, particularly like, okay, so like you say, am I going to bring like three bricks of 200? Am I going to bring a couple bricks of 3,200 black and white? What am I going to do here? Right. And Where the higher speed the film, the more sensitive it is to the x-ray machine when you're traveling. So we had, remember the big, thick x-ray God, bags yes. that you had to put your film in or you had to ha ask for a hand check? You, so first thing you would do is ask for a hand check, but sometimes pre-TSA, people are like, we don't hand check them, it goes through. Yeah. Like, okay, <laughs> put, it, put, it in the, put it in the x-ray bag, you know, and then- And so, you still said a Hail Mary. And you still said a Hail Mary because please, you don't please. know because now you got to go shoot it. Yeah. You're not going to know until it gets processed. Yeah, you don't know if that airport's x-ray machine- Was is, super is good. powerful, right. Well, you know, you just got, you know, ran through plutonium. And this was stuff that, of course, you know, photographers all over the world were dealing with because we were shooting film. But the, the logistical side of that was, yes, I needed to handle all that- uh, shoot all that keep control of those images um little things like i was detained in in osiac i was out shooting um shot uh took the viewfinder off my my camera to look down as i was i had a nice it's actually <laughs> it's actually one of only a couple images that my son has ever asked me for when he moved into his own apartment and he that this image hangs on his wall which i'm you know, if you ever want to like feel good, it's like when your kid asks you to like hang an image. Yeah. So, but it's an image of life returning to this town, the Drava River, uh, if I remember the name correctly, um, was spanned by a bridge. And on one side was Serbian controlled and the other side was Croatian controlled. And um, it was warm and people were jumping off the bridge. It was a pretty high bridge. And it just made for such a cool picture when you watch them almost hit the water and the silhouette kind of pops out against the water, you know, and all these people are lying on the bridge. And I'm, I knew enough to know that bridges are infrastructure and in war zones, you have to be very careful about shooting infrastructure um, because it, anyway, somehow strategic, somebody yeah. saw me uh, and, and we did get detained. I, I do believe Steve was with us, but um, I was just, Detained. A uh, short period of time, just a couple hours, brought over to a local police station, interrogated. But I did take that film out and I did stuff it down my pants, you know, type of thing. Um, that's a minor story compared to what people like Jeff Widener had to do to uh. get the tank man picture out of uh, Tiananmen Square. But, um, you know, little things like that. The logistics of understanding um, how to get around, where to go. When we when we went into Serbian held territory, uh, we were told to hide our passports because we entered the country through Croatia. So there is a Croatian stamp. So little things like that. Because we were traveling with UNPRFOR, right. uh, United Nation Protection Force. So they said, you might want to stash your passport somewhere. <laughs> so, I'm like, well, yeah. what happens if I need it? <laughs> then you, nobody knows who I'm with. Right. You know, I'm so. just a guy. <laughs> yeah, so. With film in my underwear. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> but whatever, you know, that's, that's you, you learn how to do that. And then you learn how to, you know, get it all home safely and, and, um, and, and get it processed. And hopefully everything works out. Right. See, that's just scrapping, getting battle scars. Right. How do you, how, you know, if you're going to get in the ring and box, you can watch all the YouTube videos you want in the world. You can even shadow box and, and, and pretend like you know what you're doing. But until somebody, you know, pops you with a jab, you don't really know how you're going to react. Right. You just don't, you know, I mean, are you going to be stunned? Are your eyes going to water, you know, but the second and third time and the fourth and the fifth, I mean, it's just like that for photography, right? The more you do things, you begin to kind of feel your way, you know, and, and, um, you know, um, you learn how to grind it out. You learn how to, you know, think on your feet. Right. As, okay. So now let's say you're, you're moving into full-time freelance, right? You've said, thank you, LA times. I've got enough clients now. I am finding magazines more to my liking. How are you making that transition and finding the work? Because now the pool gets deeper but shallow, deeper but narrow because mm. there's more people wanting that work. It's not as often, but when you get it, it's it's glorious. 
Yes. Uh, that's, you just described magazine work in a, in a nutshell, man. Right. Um, especially at that time when, there, you know, we didn't have modern day digital magazines that that are publishing a lot. You know, right. great places like Politico and others that, that you know, uh, whatever end of the spectrum you want, whether they lean left or lean right, there's a lot of publications out there that are running stuff now that are, they, they run, you know, good photography and it's strong photography. Um, but pretty much at that time when I was making that transition, uh, and even up until maybe 15, 12, 15 years ago, um, you know, there were not a lot of places to get published doing the type of work that I want to do, which is photojournalism and sports photography and so forth. So, um, you gotta, you know, Matt, you gotta just figure your way into it. So you put your book together, which at your own expense, you know, pre, pre iPad days, you know, you're going to get them printed and you're going to have multiple books and, um, you're going to, try to get to New York in DC, which is where I would go. And, um, would you da- tag team go to New York usually. and then fly into DC or and then, vice versa? Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, normally I would go to New York on a red eye and, um, cause it's cheapest and you get off and, uh, you know, the flight and you, and you make your way to, um, I stayed at a place that's called the Portland square hotel. Cause I stayed there a number of times and it was cheap. It was clean, but it was very small. Um, I won't say it was seedy in any way cause it wasn't, but, um, they did have bulletproof glass, like, you know, between you and the check-in right. person, but it had a great, uh, cafe across street coffee shop. Um, and, um, it was in midtown. So I was close to walking to see pretty much anybody in the time life building and, and McGraw Hill and business week and all the places that I was hoping downtown were Forbes and, and others. But, um, and quite frankly, you know, I walked like all the way downtown and stuff too. blisters on my feet with, with nice, you know, dress shoes on because you're in a book carrying multiple books, man. Right. Um, because I didn't want to take a cab cause it's too darn expensive. And I didn't always want to take the subway because I wasn't sure if I was going to get off the right place anyways, <laughs> you know, so the kids of the you know, sometimes I'd be Brooklyn. like, and this is usually, yes, exactly. And this is usually how it would happen. It's like, okay, if I had multiple meetings, I would walk because I needed to make sure I didn't miss multiple meetings. If it was the last meeting of the day or I was just one meeting, then I would take the subway and if I got off at the wrong exit, I'd try to leave time to make sure, you know, because sometimes you're transferring around. All right. This. But anyways, i pick pick a cheap hotel. And, would you um, cold call? That's it, man. That's it. Hi, I'm Todd. I'm coming into that's New York. It. Were you available because Thursday in, at 7? Yes. And, and, and to some degree, that that is still done today. I mean, you can certainly, you know, make electronic connections in advance. But I do stress in my workshop, in my teachings, in, in talking to other photographers, that making that human connection is really, really important. You know, one, it's nice when, you know, you can feel that, and, and I've done this, I did this not long ago, and I picked up a new client because I asked when I was out of town to meet with somebody for a couple hours, or just for a little bit, we ended up meeting for a couple hours over coffee, and I got, you know, multiple jobs from him and his other editors at this publication. And, you know, so making those cold calls, those those editors to this day, I mean, they're different people and so forth, but they still want to find new talent. So it's not something strange to them. They 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 want to find new talent. But right. at that time, definitely pre-email, pre-all, I mean, not necessarily pre-email, but definitely pre-real hardcore digital connections. Yes, you land, you call. Um they wouldn't always pick up. You leave a message, and a lot of times they call back. So, and but you know, sometimes you'd end up with a bunch of one day, and then none the next day. So you'd be like calling your wife, "Oh, this sucks." You know, there's nothing to do, and I can't. Nobody's meeting with me or whatever. But those were the days. And yeah, but you would, you know, listen. You got to develop some hard skin. You know, some hard. You know, yeah, because they're they're not always going to be really accepting of what you're showing. And right, that, that happened. And they're busy. They got stuff right. going on. They've got lives. Right, and 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 you know, if they give you five ten minutes, great. You know, and you hope that you can break in because I'm in L.A., man. There's there's great photographers out here. So if they're going to call me, they're not calling somebody else. So you got to hope for that one time where they give you a shot. And then when that shot comes through, you hope to take that and run with it. And w- with, with a complete re- reality, realistic understanding that I wasn't going to become like a, you know, everybody's going to be calling me every single day. I had a realistic perspective, but it worked. And I was getting work from time and Newsweek and U S news and, um, you know, later sports illustrated, but only because of, 
Newsweek uh, because Jimmy Colton left Newsweek and went over to Sports Illustrated. I right. never went and saw Sports Illustrated. I didn't think my work was... And plus, most of what my work was was very documentary feature-oriented. And that's not what SI was doing at the time. Not a lot of. Yeah. But they were because I've very much always been a fan of Lynn Johnson's work. And Lynn oh, was at, yeah, Lynn Johnson right. was Lynn a black Johnson, star. Yeah. So I was very familiar that she had a good little gig going with Sports Illustrated doing a lot of good stories for them. So I recognize it, but I, it never, especially when I was going to New York a lot, really occurred to me to that they would be interested in looking at my work. But, you know, a shout out to Jim because... Well, for a couple of reasons. One, when I was a student at the Eddie Adams workshop, I went from the workshop, which is in upstate New York, and I decided since I'm already back there, I'm going to go to New York for a couple of days and shop my portfolio around. Um, I don't think my portfolio is one of the best at Eddie Adams. I know it wasn't. I didn't win any of the big awards or anything. But Jimmy did say at that time, and I wasn't even on his team, um, feel free to use my name. And he was a director of Newsweek. So when I made calls, I said, hey, you know, I'm calling. I'm Todd Bigelow. I'm based in Los Angeles. I'm in New York. You know, Jimmy Colton thought it might be a good idea. And I got a lot of people calling me back. And um, to this day, I'm, I'm blessed and thankful. And I thank him every opportunity I have for opening those doors to me. And then over time, when he left and went to SI, um, he called me with a lighting gig was a first job. Um, and... Um, and then he mentioned to other editors at the magazine, hey, you know, I, you know, my editors use Todd. Not a lot. I wasn't, I wasn't a, a you know, full-time contract guy, not, right. not by any means, but I would get work from them. And, you know, next thing you knew, Sports Illustrated was calling me to do a lot of um, project oriented type work. And then event coverage. Most of the event coverage I, I did was uh, PGA Tour uh, coverage, but I did a little college football right. stuff. But And that, a lot of people don't realize that's how SI kind of was back then. It was broken up. Like George Washington did his thing. Right. And so everybody had little pieces, Nate or Maureen or Porter. Right. It was all very divided. So if Porter called you, it wasn't any, it was because he was looking for this guy. Absolutely. That's it. Maureen's looking for this. Absolutely. You had to get in with certain people. And then hopefully, if you did a good job, when um, the way it works is they do a show. So you, you get assigned a job. And then there's a, a, a meeting for the next week's magazine if your stuff is going for the next week. Right. And the editors get together for the show. And they, uh, you know, at that time with slides, they would you know, project them and they would each, whoever assigned that would basically show the work and talk about who did something. So hopefully if you were doing good work and they were showing good work, other editors were seeing your good work. Right. So, you know, I don't know, I, I wasn't inside the offices, but I started to get work from other, you know, editors. I, of course, like most of us had like the one or two that would normally call. Right. And then others that you'd hear from periodically. And it's because your work fit better perhaps with other, other, uh, you know, sections of the magazine. And it wasn't only Sports Illustrated, definitely how it worked at Time. You know, I did, uh, you know, most of the work that I did for Time was for Society. Um, and that isn't high society. That was what right. we, we called it at the time, which was most social type stuff. And then the nation section. Um, so you had to kind of get in good with them. Same with Newsweek. And, um, you and know, then those editors would move and hopefully you, they would carry exactly you on. Exactly how it works. Exactly right? how it works. Yeah. So my, my first magazine shoot was for um, a, what most of us would call a, a supermarket magazine. And I was with Blackstar. I'd just gotten on. I was making this, as I talked about, like I'm going to make this push for magazines. I was fortunate to get Blackstar to look at my work, and they were fortunate to take me on. And she got a job through the agency for a magazine called First for Women. And it's literally one of those that's on I, I'm pretty sure it's still out there. And it's like uh, this, this story, I'll never forget it. It was a woman that um, harvests her eggs for money. And I had to do a portrait of her. Interesting. Yeah. and But here's what I remember. Ann Stack, who I love dearly, and came on to my second agency as assignment director in New York at Aurora years later. Um, if I have to attribute my career, especially with magazines, to any two people, it would be Jimmy and Ann. Um and Stack said to me at that time, never forget that those editors at these ma magazines and publications that you've never heard of before are just like you. 
they're going to move on and move up and go to places that you might want to work for later. So you treat them all the same. Right. You do the best shoot you can for them. Don't let them ever forget that when they hired you, you did the best job. Right. Because I was like, who? What magazine? <laughs> what is that? Right. And then I ended up getting with some work from like Family Circle, literally, Good Housekeeping. These were great jobs. These were nice portraits. Sure. I remember for Good Housekeeping shooting this grandma that was doing hardcore gang intervention in LA. Found a cool place out on this like kind of hardcore part of where she worked. And I told her like, dress like a grandma. <laughs> For the suit, because, right. you know, it turned out to be, they love the portrait and stuff. But anyways, yeah, you know, there's no difference between West Ways and, and no, time. No. Like, it's work. It's work. Treat it like it's the best, best job, job you've ever had, and you're going to kill it. yourself for it. That's it. And, 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 I, and I think that that's how, you know, careers can can start to take you know, to, to, to take off, you know, to, uh, for others to take notice of it, because, you know, you're not only you build in a variety of images and a variety of, of abilities to, to shoot different stuff. So I can shoot portraits. Do I shoot portraits as good as Joe McNally? No, um, I can't shoot sports. Do I shoot, uh, you know, sports as good as, you know, pick any great sports photographer, you know, a Robert Beck or I mean, especially with the golf. I mean, what Robert Beck did with golf at Sports Illustrated, and I did a lot of golf stuff. What's like, you know, it was like Houdini. Like, how do you come up with this stuff? He's the needle on how you shoot golf. Yeah, right? So, um, but... You know, I hate to say I'm good enough because I do I do think I'm a good photographer. I know I'm a good photographer, but I'm good at a number of things. So I was able to acquire work from a variety of places. And that ultimately has served me very well, especially as time has gone on. Right. What's the best photo you've ever taken? Uh, the one I'm going to take tomorrow, I hope, man. <laughs> I hope. Otherwise, if it's all in the past, it's, you know, what am I doing? You know, I don't know. That's, um, I think people if have asked. Had, me. If you had, if someone comes to you and says, Todd, I'd like you to make me a print. What print do you make them? Um, that has happened. Um, I, I, I think that I would say that the best photo I've taken for reasons that I like is the one of the father and son at the border. Okay. Which yep. is, uh, uh, a shot of uh, a father and a son. I started working at the U.S.-Mexico border early in the 90s. Thanks a lot to Don Bartletti, who you've interviewed, right. um, in his work at the L.A. Times, um, which, to, to in my opinion, per, uh, is, is peerless as far as border work and really understanding the region. Um, anyways, it was a shot at Friendship Park, and it's a, a father... Uh, late in the afternoon with the uh, son kind of falling and hitting the fence. Um, and they're talking and I, and I talked to the father and my broken Spanish and, and um, he was just telling his, his son about America, he said, you know, and its opportunities. And it was, it was sad, but they weren't sad. It wasn't like they were longing, you know, it's just, you know, they, they, he was explaining it to him. And to me, it was a very, uh, moving moment and it, and it happened quickly. Uh, I was down there shooting with a friend at the time and, um, and he wasn't around, but I remember making the image and I was shooting with my Leica and M6 and Chromes and, you know, thinking, I, I, I think I just made some, I think I just made a nice image or two. <laughs> this looks really good. You know, you know how you get that like, oh man, I can't wait to get this. I can't wait to get this, you know, developed. And, you just get like yeah. stupid giddy. Yeah. 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 And it, it, because I think it's meaningful. It's, 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 it's true to what it was and it's aesthetically beautiful and um, it still resonates with me. So I, I think that's it. And that image is in, it's been exhibited uh, multiple times, um, and it is in the permanent collection at the California Museum of Photography. So. Right. What's the one you missed you want back? Oh, jeez. There, there's, there, I'm sure there's a few of them. Um, oh, man. You should have given me a heads up on that one, man. Oh, <laughs> you should have no. given me a heads up on that one, man. Yeah. I have, uh, Those are the ones that make the photographer go, oh, oh yeah. gosh. Well, there was the time. There, there, there has to be... There has to be. You know, because it could be anything from... Yeah, I'm just... The film wasn't processed properly. I one time had someone take my E6 and put it in C41. Okay, well... Because just the lab guy just grabbed wrong containers. Okay, Okay, so I have one, but I'm not sure that, I mean. But you know, but that. Yeah, absolutely. And it was ruined. Absolutely. And I, it was just like, I can't get that portrait back. Absolutely. Like, 
Okay, so oh, I, God. I got two things for you. I got two things for you. One, it wasn't something that I missed, but I almost missed. That was the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial. So the O.J. Simpson criminal trial, I was one of six magazine pool photographers rotating into the courtroom oh. on every sixth day. Right. And then those images went out to the pool. It was announced that a verdict came down at a time when the court had been adjourned for obvious reasons. And I'm, I'm downtown. I'm outside the, the building. And they announced the jury's coming back in. We don't know if they're going to announce it or what. I am panicked. I'm supposed to be in the courtroom. I got to get through security twice because there was, if I remember correctly, there was one downstairs, but there was one on the floor where the trial was right. being held. Yeah. And I'm getting through security and I'm watching the, I think they were still bailiffs at the time. They might've been marshals, whatever they were, getting ready to close the doors to the courtroom. And they closed them and I didn't get in. And I was outside and I'm like, my career's over. <laughs> My career is over. I'm done. I'm done. Oh. They're going to announce this verdict, and we're not going to have a picture. Uh, Myung, I believe, was monitoring the remote camera, which was mounted to a wall. I could be mistaken that no. day, but they didn't announce the verdict. They announced that they were going to announce the verdict the next day. So right, that they were going to re like, I think, right? They re yeah. So that was complete disaster that I would have How missed. How tight was your ass? Oh, man, I was so scared. I mean, because it wasn't just like one client. This is the magazine pool, man. I mean, I'm sure the wires were in there. But I was I was like, who? I mean, I won't get another job. You know? Yeah, you know what? Think about that. By the way, I'm not sure I ever told that story. So. <laughs> Sure but anybody it happens, knows that but it, it happens. Yeah, I mean, I got up there. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't out across the city doing something. I was there, but it's like they just announced it. Then I couldn't, I couldn't get through. Boom. Yeah. You got three minutes. Good yeah. luck. So okay, and then the other one, and I'm sure I want to go on the record of saying that I'm sure that there are a lot of good images that I that I missed over time, and I just can't recall what they are. Um, turn of the millennium. So New Year's night. New Year's Eve, turning right. into New Year's in the year 2000, a group of us decided to do a project. And we asked Martha Bardak to curate it, a West Coast photo editor for Time Magazine. So we all dispersed. We all came up with our own ideas of what we're going to do and shoot. Um, um, and then we're going to find a group show, or we're going to put it together, a group show. And it moved around a couple of places. It was really cool. I found a ride-along for part of the night with the LA County Sheriffs as a you know, what was going to happen? Cause you know, people don't remember, like they thought like clocks were going to stop and there could Y2K. be, comp- yeah. Y2K man. This was like, there could be serious mayhem. ATMs were going to shut down. Everything was going to shut down. Or, yeah. Gonna what work. was going to happen? So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do part of the night. <laughs> yeah. Right. Complete. Right. <laughs> let's, 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 let's do this. So but they, at that time it would have made the way they were thinking about it. It makes COVID look like nothing. Yes. They were literally thinking the world was going to stop. stop. Yeah, like no access to money, no like everything because well, so they the, didn't know how to program the world, the clocks that were running the world basically. They were in the computer thinking systems. sliding doors were going right. to open electronic. Right. Like everything yeah. was, planes were going to fall right. out of the sky <laughs> yeah, completely because yes. everything was being run by computerized equipment. It's like what was going to happen, right? So I thought it was a pretty good idea. So I, I worked it out, and um, so I went out and they they nothing obviously you know, uh, really bad happened, but I made images of, you know, like kind of, uh, DUIs and all this type of stuff. And I made some cool images of people on the streets and, and then I, you know, I'm sure we're shooting chromes again. So I, I process them at, a uh, A and I, because my main place, Chrome and R wasn't open for some reason. It was dark. Whoever mounted them decided to start the roll, not knowing quite where it started and started and then snipped the middle of every frame of one roll. So cut the entire roll, every frame in half. And lost, lost that entire roll of film. Oh, oh man. Last time I actually used a and I, I just, I, 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 you know, I went, I, went, I went ballistic. You know, I said, you guys know better, man. This is ridiculous. You got to know where it starts. If you don't know where it starts, you wait until I come in and say, hey, where do you want us to start mounting this? Your call, you know. Holy every, crap. Because I, I, I mounted them. So I'm, I'm like dropping these on a table going, everyone is cut in half. 
Holy Christ. So I lost a lot of, lost a, a lot of good street scene type stuff from that night. I would have destroyed their counter. I would have been looking for bodies to throw. Oh, yeah, my trust goodness. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's so. the best assignment you've had? Oh, that, that's that's a little easier. I mean, there's different there's different uh, ways in which maybe we would all judge. Like, you might judge it a little uh-huh. differently. Like, you know, is it best because you made the most resale value on it? Or is it best because you got the cover of something? Or is it best? I would say the best job I had was shooting Jordan Tutu. Okay. He was the first Inuit um, to make it into the NHL. And he lived at the top of Hudson Bay, as he liked to say, a thousand miles from concrete, a hundred miles south of the Arctic. (laughs) And it was summer. And I got a call from Sports Illustrated um, to go do um, a shoot, a hockey shoot. And I'm like, Hockey? You sure you're not supposed to be calling David? <laughs> yeah, is Kaluto in the yeah, hospital? I, mean, what, 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 what? I, I don't even know how to shoot hockey. You know, like what? Like what am I doing? So, um, they went into details about what it was, and so um, I flew up. It took uh, basically two days. So I flew into Canada, and then I had to puddle jump to Yellowknife, which is where the beluga whales congregate. Um, and then, uh, kind of not even really a, a puddle jumper, but more like a cargo puddle jumper, uh, to, uh, Rankin's Inlet. And I spent, um, I think it was four or five days. Um, wow. Yeah. Which wasn't bad. I mean, it, I've done longer jobs. Sure. I mean, Sports Illustrated one time gave me two weeks to work on a, on an out of work caddies story, which was definitely one of the better stories that I worked on too. Uh, but anyways, uh, spent, uh, J- Jordan is, is, is. This, their family is a salt of the earth. They literally live off of like what they catch and what they hunt. Um, uh, we landed at like 2 a.m. And um, the reporter called over and, and they said, oh, come on over. And it's like, what? Well, the sun goes down for like 30 minutes. Right. So they live their life. We, as they say, no, we sleep when we're tired. That's it. When That's we, it. Go, we just go to sleep. It's There's not no like clock. it's nighttime. Yeah, because at that time of year, you got to live by the sunlight. And so, we, man, we, we went out on Hudson Bay hunting seal um, or anything, whatever they saw. Right. Um, uh, he took us out on his ATVs looking for caribou. I mean, we I, it was documentary. He's like, hey, man, whatever you do, you do. Let's go. But but I, I connected with him. It was kind of a sad story. His, he had lost his brother to also to, to, to suicide. Um, but he was the first Inuit that was drafted into the NHL. So it was a behind the scenes before he got it, you know, and, and um, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal family, phenomenal shoot, beautiful light, beautiful country. You know, I'm shooting at 2 a.m. with this golden light out, you know, as he's, and they, they, if I recall correctly, they said it was the largest uh, hockey story that they ever ran. They ran seven pages in July. <laughs> wow. Right. And they didn't count on it. And, 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 and really I'll be honest again, no, no, no BS here. Um, I think any good photographer would have come up with good pictures because of the combination of light and environment and, and the people were so welcoming and everything was there for me to make good pictures. But the pictures I think exceeded what they were really expecting. Um, and, and, and they ran a really good story with a, obviously a two page spread. And, and um, those images were picked up and in, in a story ran in the New York times. I licensed in the New York times because you can't just run up the Rankins Inlet. Right. And, and not that he's up there anyways. He was now down in Nashville playing with the Predators. Uh, so that was a great story. The, and that's brave of SI because it used to be they were scared to death of hockey because when they put right. it on the cover, their, their they, they sales on the stands they would plummet. Them. Right. Right. Which is a great point. Yeah. Something I didn't even touch on because that was not something that they would usually um, devote you know, that amount of resources too, because right. it was not cheap to get up there and, and it was not cheap, you know, for, for us to, to put the whole thing together. But, you know, uh, fortunately everything came through. It's funny. People don't think of that, that way, that that's how magazines used to live and die by having an understanding of what's selling on the newsstand. The subscribers are one thing, but what's selling on the newsstand. And if it's hockey's not, 
eh, that, we'll wait just to the NHL finals. That's the only time you're getting the cover. That's it. That's it. That really is. I mean, you know, they, they, they approach it as a business. And if it's, you know, certain types of stories aren't going to sell um, or, you know, they, they can see a specific type of drop off, it only makes sense. And, 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 you know, there's there's other behind the scenes things as well, you Always. know, which is right. I mean, I had, uh, you know, Fred Vuch did a wonderful story back in the day of uh, uh, Mormons going on their uh, uh, they have to go out and do their um, mission. Yes, their mission for for uh, a year or two. I forget what two it is. years. I think yeah, it's two years. And um, he did a wonderful story that was somehow tied into golf. And, and um, I forget who it was. It was a son of a famous golfer, I believe, that was doing his mission. And um, the story, if it did ever run, was was really pared down. Um, I think for reasons that it just didn't kind of fit with the demographic. And I'm somewhat speculating on this, but there, you know, I had enough, you know, inside information. I ran into something like that personally as well too with a story that I pitched and was accepted to them on something I call outside the walls of Augusta. So we've all know Augusta as a place for the masters. Right. And we always see the beauty of the masters. I pitch a story. It's a city, man. Yeah. And it's not just a beautiful city, like any city, it's a city. Right. Like, let me go explore this a little bit, but I'm going to do it and from a journalistic way. And I, I made it pretty clear. Well, you know, if you know me and my work, it kind of came back a little hardcore, you know, and uh, it was not well received, you know, and um, it kind of got re-edited a fair amount so that a little bit more of the hardcore stuff never, never made it in. They did a, they did a good job with it. Um, I won't, I won't lie about that. And they gave it a few pages of just photos. Um, but it, 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 you it know, gets it, political. It got political and it, it, it does. And, and political because they have to sell ads. Right. And then no one's going to sell an ad for something like that uh, in a golf, especially in, and I'll throw this part in the golf at sports illustrated uh, made a lot of money. The golf part of the magazine and and the and the separate special issues made a lot of money because they the advertisers spent a lot on those publications. Right. So they didn't want to put that type of stuff in there when they're trying to sell a titleless ad for fifty thousand or whatever the case is. You right. know, I don't know. And 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 it makes it more difficult. So and you remember when they started uh, making the magazines uh, a little more specific? They would I think it was like maybe mid nineties. They said, oh, if you like college football, we'll give you a little, like, 12 more sections of college football, golf, NASCAR. Right. right. That became very political for them. If you're starting to do something where you're pulling back and showing the strip club in that golf town right. that's got, you know, come get your masters on. Right. You know, right. after hours. Right. They don't want to see that. Right. Nobody's ever looked at the masters that way. Right. You're not allowed to run. You got to right. be, you know, there's all these, which was the whole point of me wanting to do it is it was complete opposite of what the masters tries to put out as it's very, it's very proper and very sophisticated right. and very, you know, traditional. And I wanted to say, okay, but that's, you know, that's what everybody knows Augusta for, but that's not, that's not reality. Right. They're still probably the only uh, tournament or, or stadium or whatever, you how you want to refine it, that has still absolute control. Mm -hmm. Like it's a private club. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know there was some beef. Someone said, oh, drop this, drop that membership of somebody. They've got a grip on everything yep. that happens in that place. Yep. Your yeah, caddies are still true. wearing white jumpers. You're not allowed to do certain things. I mean, I remember when Tiger comes in and people are hooping and hollering. They did not like that at Augusta. Yeah, I know. They frowned upon Absolutely. that. Absolutely. It's very stead and very traditional. Right. You and watch those Ben Hogan or look at those Ben Hogan photos and, and of Jack and stuff. It was very prim and proper. You and I would have been in a white uh, Absolutely. Oxford shirt slope and a white tie with a cigarette and a fedora watching right. and uh, sipping whatever their right. signature drink is. And walking around right. slowly at the golf right. course. Right. And it's one of the few, if not only places, and I never covered the tournament, that you're not inside the ropes. Photographers no, are not inside the no, ropes. No, you're not. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. not allowed. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I know that's definitely the case there. But and it's, I, and it's yeah. brutal. Yeah, it's brutal. Yeah, because yeah, you brutal. cover enough golf. And, oh, and yeah. Stuff. I've never you covered the Masters. But, but and, golf and, in general. And to be honest with you, I never wanted to. 
for that reason alone. Yeah. That reason alone. Yeah. You know, it's difficult enough. It's a difficult sport to cover anyway. It's inside the ropes. <laughs> right. Jumping ahead, right. keeping track right. of the leaderboards, right. all this stuff. Yeah. Then you get there, you literally have to have yeah. people stationed. Yeah. And, and you know, interestingly enough, I found um, in Augusta, there's a street corner. And I, I found it. I don't even remember how we found it. Um, it was a place where former caddies at Augusta, because Augusta draws from the from the local population, right. hang out. They, it's a it's a street corner. It's just a street corner. It's got an old caddy painted fading on the wall. Like that must I, somebody might have just mentioned it, and then I went searching for it. It's called the Sand Hill Grill, and it's an old caddy painted on the wall, faded. And I go by there, and there's people hanging out, and they're old caddies, and they're drinking beer. And they're just kicking it. They're cutting up on one another. So I'm like, hey, this is what I'm doing. They're like, ah, you want a beer? I'm like, sure. Of course. You know, let me hang out with you guys for a little bit. I just want to shoot. You know, right. and, and and I did. And and they ended up using those pictures. But it was that was more of what I was after. And I would have never found that had I not pitch and gone done that story. But there are other aspects to that story that I would have liked to have seen published. But you know, it is it is what it is. Fast forward maybe 10 years. I love the fact. And one of the last jobs I did before Sports Illustrated changed their contract was I was told to go shoot the 2015 US Open up in Seattle. And I was told I would not be shooting any golf. And I'm like, I got you now. I know what you want me to do. Uh So the editor at the time, Miriam, who I'll I'll throw Miriam in there with Jim and, and, and Ann. Um, Love dearly. Hope to see later on this year. She's, she's the last the, surviving member. She's just the best. Well, she's not at SI. No, no, no. She left. Oh, yeah. She, Mir- Miriam Marceau. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. there's yes. No, Miriam Marceau is 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 uh, living in Italy right now. Um, she she wanted me to do behind the scenes. So basically, I was the the and they gave me a full section like the I was it was just feeding the web. We had runners and 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 you know a trailer and they were putting it out and I was right. anything man I had a blank slate Matt it, whatever you come across right and it was just I was in Tacoma wasn't it it was in Tacoma right. so man I did go down and I found some like different areas and and then I was on the course but I was looking oh like wait a minute that that kid's twelve years old and he's selling bottles over the fence of water to try to make some bucks I'm like I'm on that kid you right. know I went to the side streets and I found scalpers with hundreds of dollars in cash and I I'm like hey man this is what I'm doing dude you mind if I kind of like you know so after about 15 minutes I started to get a little antsy hey I got what I need I'm, I'm bouncing out of here and I went to another so I had an assistant we would drive around you spoke of that sign with the masters thing there was a sign in Tacoma it was a massage <laughs> sign and it was like happy hour for the US Open and I took pictures of it, it did not, I don't yeah. think it made it I literally did not see every single image but they gave me like a whole you know uh, behind the scenes with photojournalist Todd Bigelow type thing you know and they're just feeding images out there every single day and um, it was phenomenal but they they entrusted me to, to, to do it but I mean there was editing going on right. obviously yeah. they were editing it before they put it out there but well, oh, oh wait, what, oh, wait, what's wait, that? wait, and even for money, I, I, even funnier because I mean, here you had you know uh, Robert Peck on on the shoot, and and Kojo was on the shoot, and um, I forget if anybody else was. So they were covering the golf, and I mean, these guys are they're they're demons with golf and other sports, but they're just great. Well, the last day we're no longer feeding my behind the scenes, so they're like, Todd, go go, we want you to be the third shooter on course. Um, they're gonna go with the leaders. Um, you go, you know, mess around, do some stuff, but make sure you're on the 18th green, you know, hours before the end of the tournament, because you know how it works. Somebody might end up winning that was like the fourth group before, just by matter of how things shake out. We got to make sure. We, it, so it shoot, happens. At, shoot everybody coming through the final green. Well, I, I did. So I got a great spot, you know, um, and then I ended up having a really good angle on the putt that Dustin Johnson missed to win the tournament and Jordan Spieth ends up winning the tournament and they end up uh, using that. <laughs> you know, I go shoot like half a day and poor Robert and, and Kojo are like humping the tournament right. for like, it, it. this was a huge hilly course for days. Now they had tons of other great stuff, but that was like, you know, I just happened to have a good angle from up above on, on the putt just sneaking by, you know? Oh, 
So it's kind of funny how those things work out. I know. It's goofy that way. Let's dive into how do you, like with those caddies, let's, let's break that down. How do you work your way into subjects like that and, and make them feel comfortable that, Oh, you know, they're hanging out in their little watering hole, drinking beer. And all of a sudden you show up with a couple of cameras and you're like, Hey, uh, you don't mind if I throw one back with you and take pictures. <laughs> you don't know me from Adam. Like how, what's your process on that? Uh, 12 pack at least. <laughs> no, I can always show up with there. Right. No. Um, well, because it's, 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 it's a legit a skill. question. It is. It's a and, skill. and that's journalism. That's photojournalism. So my background really is in that. And you know, how was I able to convince, you know, uh, smugglers to let me shoot them, you know, along the border? How was I able to run across, you know, the Tijuana levee and sneak into the country? And <laughs> you didn't hear that here type thing, you know? Right. Uh, and, 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 you know, because you have to, I don't know. People have to learn how to trust you, I guess. And and I guess that just is partially who you are, but also how you approach things. So I'm, I'm real. I don't ever obviously lie or try to be somebody I'm not. But um, along the border, I would get there hours before I knew I would want to make images because I'm just hanging around basically some criminal activity and so forth. And on these other shoots like the caddies in, in, in Augusta and also the caddy story that I did for like two weeks, like five days in San Diego, five days up here in LA, same thing. I'm suddenly just in the parking lot with a bunch of out of work caddies trying to tell their story. They don't know me from anybody. Right. right? And who wants to be, you know, uh, portrayed as somebody that's maybe down and out of a job. Right. So you're up against some circumstances, but, um, I'm honest. So one, I, I don't shoot with a lot of gear. Okay. Okay. So I usually don't walk up with two cameras. I'm usually going to have maybe one camera, um, pre-digital. It was a Leica a lot of times. Um, I, I was shooting, you know, Canon film cameras why, as well. Why did you go to the Leica? It's small, unassuming, um, non-professionals uh, knew that what it was, but I wasn't hanging around professional photographers. Right. I was hanging around normal people. So not threatening. It, non-threatening. And, that, and that's it. I don't want to be perceived as some guy that's clanging up there with a bunch of gear. Um, you know, my, my bags tend to not look like photo bags. Um, I'm, I kind of have a bag fetish, man, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> but um, that's very dangerous. It's very dangerous, man. So, but I like kind of typical little messenger bags that aren't even, some of them aren't even photo bags and I'll just drop a lens or a body in it. Right. So I think that actually plays a part because I don't come up and overwhelm them with like, oh, there's a journalist, photo, photo, you know, yeah. So, and then um, you work your way around the perimeter and you work your way into the interior is how I like to kind of describe it to younger students is, is, you know, you might even pass up a shot or two, not might, you usually do pass up a shot or two when you, if it happens quickly, because you don't want to be like aggressively in their face if you plan on spending any amount of time there. Um, and you just ease into it and let them just be yourself. And, you know, I did a shoot for People Magazine out on on, on Lake Havasu. Uh, you know, it was about drunken boating, but it was basic on Memorial Day, which is like debauchery at its, like, craziest. I mean, this is just a, a lake full of people partying and taking off their clothes and, and all sorts of things. And it was kind of a serious story, but I had to find my way onto boats where people were partying crazy and stuff like that. So, you know... I, and I did. Um, and when I'm on that boat and I'm shooting, you know, your T-shirts and your shorts because it's, you know, Memorial Day. You don't want to go out there in a sweater and loafers. OK, right. I'm saying in the obvious, but you'd be surprised. And if somebody is like, oh, man, you're you're all right, dude. Yeah, I'd love to be a people man. You want a beer? I'm going to be very responsible. But I'm not going to be like, no, man, I, I, I'm working. You know, I'm going to be like, yeah, sure, I'll take a beer. You know, and I'll, I'll nurse that beer right. for a period of time. Four hours. Yeah, but, but whatever. Have, yeah. yeah, I mean, I want, I want to be, I want to blend. I don't, because I want them to forget about me. I'm not going to influence. I'm not going to, you know, be part of all their conversations. But if they talk to me, I'm going to talk back to them, put my cameras down and be a normal person. And that's usually how I work because I don't I don't tend to shoot a lot of images at once. Like I might be talking to somebody and then, you know, the conversation will turn or something and then they'll be doing something and I'll pick up the camera quickly and I'll fire off a, a frame or two. And then the camera will go back down around my neck and I'll hang out. So as a lot of my friends and colleagues say, you know, and I truly believe this, I think photojournalism is the art of hanging out. It's really not about photography. It's really about how well can you, you know, be with others so that you can accurately tell their perspective in a short period of time. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit of, um, 
it's a bit of an art to, to hang out in a group and know when when the right time to pull that camera. Yeah, and, yeah, and not be over and like you said, overbearing and just start banging away in the first thirty seconds. Like, right. oh, I'm going to be here for a couple hours. That's I'm going right. to let it take my time and slowly percolate. And they'll come. You might miss some, like you said. Right. It's going to come back around. That's it. That's it completely. You know, and and I've had that in so many different projects and stories I've shot over time that it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's, you just have to almost chill. You gotta, you gotta relax, man. Right. And, and let, let the things develop. And, and if I might, you know, kind of throw a point in here, I think that that's one of the, um, casualties of photojournalism these days. And, and a big reason for that is the the budgets for photojournalism are not what they used to be. So you're, expected to almost create situations and quickly come back with stuff instead of allowing a story to develop. So um, I've been given a lot of talking points and things to look for for in a story that never materialized. And I get asked, how come I didn't shoot them? Well, they weren't there. That's why you're, you're conceiving things when they're not there. So, you know, the role of photojournalism really is to hang out and and, and capture what occurs. Has that worried you that they're perceiving, whether it's in New York, Chicago, Miami, like, hey, Todd, why didn't you get that? And if not, why didn't you make it happen? I've always been worried about that. I think any photographer has. I've, I've been blessed to work with most most of the editors I've ever worked with, never had that perspective and, and, and really were opening. They might ask. Um, and when I say that I've worked with, most that I've worked with on a regular, consistent basis. But I have had that um, preconceived idea implanted many times and more so... In, in in the last 10 or 12 years because you're not being given days to let a story develop. You're being given a day and now you're going out to create a portrait perhaps in an environment that helps convey the concept of something instead of capturing what it happens. There's, it's a different approach to shooting it. And and, and I don't fault the editors. I, I, I fault, I mean, it's, it's just a consequence of how our profession has gone. There's, there's not a lot of money in it anymore for them to assign 10 days for me to go do a shoot or even three days for me to go do right. a shoot. Yeah. And that's the sad part. Yeah, it is. And, and so they have to kind of illustrate it more than allow it to, to happen. Thank you for listening to part one of my conversation with Todd Bigelow. Please click the like button if you enjoyed the episode. Subscribe as well. And remember, you can find all of our shows on the website, jessagoodconversation.com.